Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Cokesbury Church. You guys doing well? It's good to see you guys, man. I'm glad you're here. If this is your first time with us, my name is Stephen. I'm the senior pastor, and we're honored that you guys are here. What a great day, man. We've got people sitting in overflow. I want to say good morning to everybody watching us online, so put your hands together and help me welcome those guys. There are things that <clears throat> happen that you think, I'm never going to experience that at church. And um, for me, today is one of those. I never thought I'd hear Celine Dion. Uh, <laughs> So uh, for the under 35 crowd, that was Celine Dion that sang that song. So, but um, man, I listen, y'all, I've been all over the country and I've been to all sizes of churches. I've been some that are five, six times the size of Cokesbury. And I would take this team right here over anybody else's team. Um, <clears throat> These guys, they are legit, and so I'm glad to be able to serve with them. So we're in this series uh, called Love is All You Need, and if this is your first time with us, what we're doing is taking an in-depth look at what God says love's supposed to be about, because what I know from being around the church is that we do a good job of talking about love, but we never give it any legs. We never talk about, well, what's that supposed to look like in my everyday life? And so what happens is we end up building some general agreement about love. And what I'm convinced is the world doesn't change because we don't leave places like this and put it into practice in our life. And so this series is sort of our chance to kind of pump the brakes, to get an understanding of what God's trying to do through us so that when we do leave this place and go back to our lives, whether it's our workplace or hanging out in our neighborhood or for those of us that are students, when we go to school, we're better in tune with what God's trying to do in our life. And so we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's by far, I think, the most famous words ever written about love. And there've been a lot of people who've tried to write on this subject, but I don't know of anyone that more effectively gives a description of love than the apostle Paul. And so I wanna read the opening words again to us this week. And it's, uh, I wanna read it from the message because I think it really captures the essence of what Paul was trying to say. So he writes to the church, if I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but I don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all mysteries and making everything as plain as day, and if I have a faith that says to a mountain, jump and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I am bankrupt without love. I like that word bankrupt. I'm running on empty. I've got nothing else left. And so what Paul's trying to communicate is if I have everything, if I take love away from that, then ultimately I have nothing. And Paul understood even back in the days of Corinth that human beings, we would all be chasing after something and so what Paul is saying is, you can chase your heart out, but while you're running through your life, if you don't learn how to love God and love people, when you get to the end of your life, you're gonna be completely bankrupt. You'll have nothing to show for your life. Now the alternatives to love may be a little different in our day than they were in Corinth. And I was thinking if Paul were writing this today, what would he say? And here's what I think it might go like. If I tweet like Justin Bieber and I have more Instagram followers than Taylor Swift, but I don't love, I'm not linked in to God. If I get a BA from UT and an MBA from Vanderbilt, if I pick up an IPA from George Clooney, but don't love, I have only pieces of paper in pretty frames. If I drive a Prius and save the climate, if I create a company that's valued at a billion dollars, if I'm written up in Forbes and Warren Buffett asks my advice, if I get my kids into Harvard without bribing anybody, <laughs> if I outshoot Steph Curry, if I outbrand Kim Kardashian, if I outsing Lady Gaga, but I don't have love, I am as yesterday as MySpace. <laughs> right? That went over about like I thought it would. 
but I've done it all weekend long. I got one more left and by goodness, I'm gonna stick with it. So <clears throat> listen, what we're learning is that the single purpose of your life and the single purpose of my life is to become a thoroughly loving person, listen to this, that's rooted in our relationship with Jesus. So make no mistake about it, I'm not talking about becoming a better person. I'm not talking about modifying our behavior. I'm talking about because you and I are rooted in a relationship with Jesus, there ought to be an output from your life and my life. And what Paul is saying is that output that is going to change the world, it is this thing called love. And so what we're doing over these weeks in this series is we're asking everyone to take seriously the idea of asking God to help us make love the number one commitment of our life. And since we can so often get confused about the nature of love, when Paul's writing this letter, he makes this opening statement and then he goes on to give what I think is the greatest description of what love should consist of that's ever been written. And for Paul, this whole idea of love came from Jesus' life and from his teaching and from his death and resurrection. And so I wanna get into this week's aspect of love with a question about Jesus. There's a guy named Dallas Willard, tremendous theologian, died a few years ago. I'm by far one of the greatest um, influences on my life when it comes to forming theology and thinking about God. And uh, he's in a conversation. One time this guy asked him a question. If you had to describe Jesus in just one word, what would be that word? And that, I think that's a pretty fascinating question. In fact, I bet if you and I were to take time and make a list, we could come up with a quite exhaustive list of words that we would use to describe Jesus. But in this case, there was a long pause and the person asked Dr. Willard, what word would you choose? Now understand, he may be the smartest person I've ever come across in my life. And by far the deepest student of Jesus in the scriptures that I've ever seen. And this is the word he chose to describe Jesus. He said, relaxed. Jesus is relaxed. That would not make the top 200 words that I would use to describe Jesus. In fact, for those of us that grew up around the church, it's not present in any of our creeds. Like I believe in Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate and seriously relaxed. <laughs> it doesn't sound religious enough, right? But maybe that's the point. Jesus arrived on this planet in very unique circumstances. From about the age of 12, he himself told everybody that his mission in life was to be about the business of his father. He had a vocational weight on his shoulders that was unprecedented in human history because the situation of Israel and the condition of the human soul was spiraling out of control. And yet he worked as a carpenter in obscurity somewhere in the city of Nazareth. And he did that year after year after year. He turned 18, he turned 20, 25, 29, and he's still just hammering nails and selling boards. And when you look back on it, you're like, well, Jesus, <laughs> the clock's ticking, brother. We gotta get a step on, right? It's time to get this thing launched. And finally, he starts his ministry. There's a guy named John the Baptist. He was not the first Southern Baptist. He was baptizing people, so he was known as John the Baptist. He gives Jesus this huge launch. There are massive crowds. Everybody wants to hear Jesus teach. And so the first step that he takes in ministry is to go off the grid for 40 days in a desert somewhere so he can be alone with God in unhurried prayer. When he finally gets around to his ministry, his first sermon is in his hometown. And it was so radically inclusive of people who were outside the faith that people actually wanted to kill him. Luke 4 tells us they were primed, man. They were ready. They were gonna throw him off a cliff. And I don't know about y'all, but that would have made me a little nervous. Like rarely 
Do I finish teaching and walk up front and my wife asked me, how did the sermon go? And I'm like, well, they wanted to kill me, but I gave them the slip, so I guess I'm gonna come back next week. <laughs> and yet Luke says that when Jesus finished teaching, even though people wanted to kill him, Jesus just cruised right down through the center of the crowd with not a care in the world. He could only be in one place at one time. He literally traveled at the speed of foot. He and his disciples were walking through Samaria and Jesus tells them, you guys go on up, find us some food. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kick back and relax here at this well for a little while. And so they come back and they find that Jesus is talking to this um, Samaritan Gentile woman. She's been married five times and the guy she's shacking up with is not her husband. No rabbi would go anywhere near this woman and yet there he is, totally relaxed, having a conversation with this woman as if they'd known each other for decades. Or one time they're in a boat and the storms are so bad that the disciples are losing their minds. And listen, these guys are fishermen. They've been around boats their entire life long. They had been through storm after storm after storm and yet there was something about this storm that got them all sideways. And there is Jesus in the back of the boat taking a nap. And there's some theology there. The next time your spouse gives you a hard time for taking a nap, just say, I'm trying to be more like Jesus, <laughs> right? At one point, that's as good as it's gonna get to. <laughs> At one point, his teachings are so challenging to the people who are following him that they start dropping out. There's fewer and fewer people hanging out around Jesus. And his disciples are like, look, we gotta go to Jerusalem. Like, we gotta do something. We gotta get the momentum back. And yet Jesus just says to them, calm down. It's not my time yet. It's gonna come. There was another time he was taking a whip to the money changers in the temple. It's a pretty familiar story. And we're told in the gospels, that in the temple he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple. And I think most of us have read that story a thousand times and I would argue that most of us, because of the pace of life that we live, we skate right over that. But notice what he is doing. He takes the time to braid the whip himself. Imagine that. His disciples are like, Jesus, what are you doing? Braiding a whip. Couldn't you get a pre-braided whip? <laughs> like, couldn't you miracle one up because these money changers are gonna get away? And Jesus is like, nah, I'd rather just make this whip myself because we're gonna have a blast together. And those money changers, they're not gonna go anywhere. We see this maybe most in his relationship with his, with his disciples. They were a very slow group. They were slow to understand what he taught. They were slow to understand who he was. They were slow to obey. They were slow to trust him. They were slow to give themselves away through acts of service. They misunderstood him. They doubted him. They denied him. And most of them in the end tried to abandon him. And Jesus himself diagnosed their condition at the very end of the Gospel of Luke. He said, how foolish you are and how slow to believe. Now I guarantee you, if you were the leader of an urgent movement and you're on the clock, the last quality you want in your team is slowness. You see, Jesus is teaching here. Through every moment of his life, through every interaction he had with people, Jesus is teaching us about love. And the very first characteristic of love that Paul describes in his letter, he says, love is patient. Maybe relaxed is a great word to describe Jesus because it gets us out of the religious category. Sometimes I think we hear that word patience and we think of kind of teeth gritting endurance, right? Like you're in the heat of the moment. You're like, God, give me the patience to put up with this fool that anybody else would go off on. Help me suppress my rage. That's what we think of when we think of patience. But Jesus was not a teeth gritter. 
He was not uptight. He was never stressed out. He was not ill-tempered and he never found himself at the end of his rope. This was well known among his disciples. Like they never said to one another, man, you gotta watch out. I don't know what happened last night, but Jesus got up on the wrong side of the bed and this dude is out after it. Like they never said that about Jesus. He was the most relaxed person that ever lived. Not because he lived in pleasant circumstances. Not because everything always went his way, but because love is patient. Patience for a lot of us, if we could be honest with ourselves, it is our Achilles heel. There's a survey done a couple of years ago of a a church uh, in the Atlanta area. They reach about 30,000 people every single weekend. And they asked their people, which fruit of the Spirit would you most like to grow in? Um, If you're not familiar with the fruit of the Spirit, there are nine of them. Um, Paul, the guy that wrote the letter that we're digging in now, he described them as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So there are nine of them. Which one of those fruits would you like to grow in? More than 50% of the 30,000 that took the survey said they wanted to grow in patience. In other words, more people felt like they needed to develop patience than all the other eight fruits of the Spirit put together. See, I think patience may be the most underrated virtue in the marketplace. And I think leaders and I think bosses, they don't want to be known as patient because they are convinced that patience means you're soft or that patience means you're not fully devoted to the, to the mission. But patience in the Bible it does not mean being passive. It does not mean that you lack a sense of urgency about yourself. It does not mean that you're failing to hold people accountable or that you're somehow tolerating entropy. Now, patience is the ability to dwell gladly in the present moment when you would prefer not to. That's what patience is. It often gets translated as long suffering because it means that love has the ability to suffer difficulty for a long time and not stop loving. How different is that from the culture in which you and I live? Paul says patience, love is patient, it's long suffering. It hangs in there, it doesn't give up the moment things get difficult. It does not run away when it feels like it's becoming impossible. When things get uncomfortable, love stays right there. It is patient. It is long suffering. It hangs in even when you don't want to hang in anymore. I would argue that is diametrically opposed to the world in which you and I live. Because our world will walk away from a relationship at the drop of a hat. And our world will try to bail from a circumstance the moment it gets difficult. And our culture drives us, as long as we are comfortable, we're gonna be fulfilled. There is no comfort in patience. It's long suffering. It hangs in there. And this has always been hard for human beings. And I think it's harder to be patient now than it was in Jesus' day because of the nature of the world in which we live and because we have technology and the pace of most of our lives is accelerating at an exponential pace. There are people in this room. You remember when we got fast food. For the first time, we tried to get uh, get food not because of how good it was or how cheaply we could get it, but because we could get it in a hurry. And even then, You had to go into the fast food restaurant and order it and you had to sit down at the table and eat it. So that wasn't good enough. So a couple of, uh, many decades ago, we invented the the drive-through window so that families could eat in their minivan the way God intended them to eat, right? (laughs) We invented not just dating, but speed dating, self-checkout, overnight shipping and instant messaging. We text but we don't even like to spell out words anymore. So we've got all these acronyms or we'll shoot an emoji to one another, right? We look at screens until we are absolutely exhausted. I am not making this up. 
When asked about the competition from Amazon Prime and other streaming services, the CEO of Netflix shrugged, shrugged his shoulders and said that their biggest competition was sleep. That that's what they were after. Make people stop wasting so much time sleeping so they can look at more things streaming on their screens. You can put it to the test yourself. Let Facebook go down for half a day. Let your cell phone service black out for a day and people absolutely lose their minds. Well, Dallas Willard wrote, one of the things you do when you become a disciple of Jesus is you begin to do those things you've always known you should be doing. In other words, there's something <coughs> inside of every human being. And I would argue it was placed there by God. It's more than a hole and it's bigger than a vacancy. I think it's this desire, I think it's this longing for something more in life than maybe what we're getting. And what I know is that there are some of us, we're gonna spend our entire life long and we're gonna chase after everything under the sun because that desire and that longing, it does not get satisfied the older you get. It just becomes bigger and stronger the older you get. And it becomes a driving force of our life. There's something inside every human being. We know that we need to maximize life. It is not a secret that the clock of every human being's life is ticking. And God has given us a finite number of days on this planet. And this life is not a dress rehearsal for another life. It's the only life that we're gonna get. And some of us are gonna get a lot of days and some of us, our days are numbered. But I have yet to meet a human being that did not want to get to the end of their life and be able to say at the very least, I lived the kind of life I should have lived. That's what Dr. Willard is describing here. There's something deep down inside of every follower of Jesus that makes us wanna do what Jesus said do. And friends, until you and I step into that reality, until we embrace that truth, then we're just gonna spin our wheels and we're never gonna live the life that we wanna live. See, I think that's what Paul's saying, that love is patient. And patience can help relieve some of the pressure of feeling like you gotta to conform to this world. Because make no mistake about it, for those of us that are following Jesus, we should look different than the world in which we live. Not crazy. <laughs> Not radical, but different. And yet one of the fears I carry for my own life and a fear that I carry for all of our lives is that when our culture looks at us, they just see a reflection of the culture. And we talk a good game and we use Jesus as a convenient out. But when they look at our life and their life, they don't see a difference. Paul's saying love is a big deal. And if you get to the end of your life and you don't have love, then you've wasted your life. You can stack up whatever achievement you wanna stack up. You can get all the likes on social media you wanna get. You can surround yourself with all the friends you wanna get, but if you don't let them in, if you don't love God and love people in a way that is transformational to those who are in your life, then you have squandered your one and only opportunity. On the surface, <laughs> Impatience looks like such an absurdly trivial thing. But impatience will kill your prayer life. Impatience will really mess up your relationship with your kids. Impatience will make you live a very, very shallow life. And we see it everywhere, right? I don't wanna finish this assignment. I don't wanna stick with this diet. I don't wanna stay in this marriage. I don't wanna honor my commitment. I don't wanna stay on this budget. I don't wanna honor God with my sexual behavior because I want what I want and I want it when I want it. Paul's saying you can live your life that way and you can experience life that way, but you gotta understand that love is patient and love is long suffering. Love doesn't bail when things get tough. 
See, God wants to grow patience inside of us. And how will he do it? (laughs) He'll give you something to be patient about. What I've learned in my own life as I've struggled with patience, and listen, y'all, I'm one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. I am one of the least patient people on the planet. But I have discovered that you need two things. You need an irritant and you need time to grow your patience. And what I've discovered is that God will give you time and God will give you an irritant. In fact, some of us are sitting next to our irritant right now, amen? (laughs) And if you came in without an irritant, DM me on Twitter or see me out in guest services. We keep a list of irritants around this place (laughs) and I will gladly share some of my irritants with you guys. You can grow in patience. Paul says, love is patient and love is kind. They go hand in hand. These are the two positive aspects of love that Paul begins with. And then he goes on to talk about eight negatives. He talks about how love does not envy and it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not keep a record of wrongs. And we're gonna look at some of those over the next few weeks. But these are the two positive ones. Love is patient. It is long suffering. It goes the distance. It waits. And love is kind. Kindness is the action side of love. So the question that loving people ask is, is there anybody in my life that I can show kindness to? That's our question for the week. Who can I show kindness to? You really can do that, every single one of us. Doesn't take an education, doesn't take a resume, doesn't take any money at all. Who can I show kindness to? Now, in the moments we have left, I wanna give you some practices in addition to showing kindness that I think will grow your patience this week for the purpose of love. I've known this message is coming, so I'm a week ahead of you guys on these practices and I'm experiencing a little growth in my own life. And they're gonna seem incredibly trite and silly for some of us, but they really do make a difference. Here's the first practice to grow your patience. Slow down, like legit, slow down. In this practice, I deliberately put myself in positions where I have to wait or move more slowly than I otherwise would want to in order to cultivate my capacity for patience. So just this week, okay, starting when you leave for the next seven days, drive the speed limit joyfully. (laughs) I'm serious. I've done it all week long. If the sign says 35, drive 35. I live out at the end of Pellissippi toward Oak Ridge. It's 55 miles an hour. For seven days, I have driven up Pellissippi Speedway at 55 miles an hour. People are losing their minds. (laughs) I was driving down Emory Road yesterday and got passed on Emory Road because I was driving 45. I got a little taste of maybe how other people experience me. (laughs) When you come to a stop sign, stop. Like all the way. Let your tires actually stop moving. And ask God to give you patience in that moment. This week when you're driving, instead of treating other drivers like your enemy, actually ask yourself out loud, is there anyone I could show kindness to? You really can drive that way. When you're at a stoplight and there's a car in front of you and the light turns green and there's no movement, help me Jesus. (laughs) Instead of having your normal reaction, speak out loud the words of Jesus, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. Right? (laughs) Here's one. Deliberately drive in the slow lane. Uh, So if you're driving the speed limit, get out of the left lane. Okay? That's only going to irritate people more. But I promise you, if you drive in the slow lane, you're going to get where you want to go. You're going to cost yourself at the most about one minute. But I know from experience, when you get where you're gonna go, 
You're way more relaxed than you were when you got in the car. Today, when you leave this room, walk slowly. I know there's a crowd trying to come in. I know the parking lot's chaos. I know your kids are gonna be screaming bloody murder when you pick them up. But walk slow. Don't look at the clock, realize we have four minutes left and start planning your escape route like most of y'all are planning right now. <laughs> right? I was thinking about this this week. What if somebody came to our church this weekend for the very first time? And when they go back to their life, one of their friends asked them, well, what was it like? What if the first thing they said to their friend was, people were just so relaxed. There was this peaceful feeling. They weren't at all rushed. They actually had time to look you in the eye and they talked to me. And at least for that hour, it felt human. Sometimes you gotta slow down. Here's another practice, notice people. <laughs> Love is patient because only patient people really notice other people. In fact, I would argue you cannot love people if you don't really notice people. And Jesus, he noticed people. It was Jesus who noticed a tax collector up in a tree named Zacchaeus. It was Jesus who noticed a man born blind from birth who other people did not even recognize. It was Jesus who who um, noticed a woman who touched the hem of his garment in a huge crowd of people. And it was Jesus who noticed little children. Of course, his disciples knew that Jesus wouldn't have time for them. And yet every single time, Jesus noticed people. In fact, I would argue Jesus is the greatest people noticer of all time. Why? It's because relaxed people look and hurried people overlook. And finally, because love is long suffering, it's quick to forgive. You can practice forgiveness this week because every single one of us is gonna have lots of opportunities to do a little relational repair along the way. Paul wrote, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. In every moment, love is patient. And in every moment, love is kind. And when you and I surrender ourselves to God and we allow that to be what we receive from him and we allow that to be what we give to other people, I'm living in the unseen reality of the kingdom of God. Y'all, this is deeper than being a good person. This is more important than behavior modification. This is not adding something else to the list so that if we check off enough boxes that God maybe will be pleased enough to let us go to heaven when we die because God knows we're living by enough boxes. So love is patient, love is kind. And then I gotta add to that, don't drink, don't smoke, don't kick your dog, right? Don't cuss. God is less interested in behavior modification, although some of the behaviors some of us are caught up in, they are gonna rob us of life. But God is less interested in you becoming a good person and way more interested in you becoming the son or daughter that he created you to be. See, Jesus' main goal was not to get you to change your behavior, but to do a little bit of heart surgery and change you from the inside out so that you don't go through your life being a reflection of the culture, but that you'll go and you'll be a light set on a hill for the world to see. Love is patient and love is kind. And that kind of love will change the world. But you cannot stop at general agreement. You gotta see yourself as a conduit through which Jesus is gonna work this week to allow you the strength to not run when you wanna run. And to give you the, the courage to be kind when you don't wanna be kind. So this week, the challenge is the same as it was last week. To join me every day praying the prayer, God, would you make me a more loving person? Because love that is patient and kind, in the end, that's the love that got me to an altar. 
It was someone who was being long-suffering who would not walk away from me, showing me the kindness of God's grace that got me to the point where I could not sit still any longer, where I had reached the crossroads in my life as a student, that I had to do something with Jesus because he wasn't a guy in a book and it wasn't somebody that a preacher got up and screamed and spit about one hour a week for most of my life. No, Jesus was a real person. And I realized for the first time in my life through patience and kindness that Jesus was the answer to every question I've been looking for. And I remember sprinting down the aisle at Hicks United Methodist Church and I fell flat on my face at an altar. And I didn't care who was around me. I just prayed the prayer, Jesus, come into my life. And y'all, I have never been the same again. And I got a sneaking suspicion. There's a bunch of us right now. That is your story. Somebody was patient. And somebody was kind. And this man became your savior. And your life has never been the same again. Now listen, y'all, I know we've gone two minutes over and I know you gotta go. But I want you to know the altars of our church are always open. If you need to leave, we're not gonna judge you, I promise you. Just trying to have a little fun with you. But I know the most important moment that any human being is gonna spend over the next seven days is with bowed head and bent knees. A moment before a sovereign, holy, and just God. It's that business that gets done when you bring yourself before God. So we've got one more song. Those of you that need to leave, I'm gonna ask you to leave quietly out the back. If you need to speak with someone, you can exit right now and you can go straight across the hall to our care room. But I want you to know the altars of our church are always open. So you come now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.